Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the chair of the Greater Houston Partnership, Scott McClellan. Hey, good morning. Grab a seat if everybody would. What a good turnout. Nothing makes me happier than to see a lot of people show up with an interest in public education. Super. My name is Scott McClellan. I'm the uh, uh, part, uh, the current chair for the Greater Houston Partnership, and in my spare time, I work at HEB. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Greater Houston Partnership's first ever State of Education event, and hopefully there are many more to come. You know, high quality education is a top priority, not only for the Greater Houston Partnership, but for the business community at large. Houston's human capital is the greatest asset the region possesses, and a strong, diverse economy relies on creating opportunities for everybody who lives in our city so that they can improve their lives. And a well-funded and effective public education system is critical to generating opportunities for all of our residents. Now, if you know me, you know that public education is a personal passion of mine, and in addition, to my previous work as the chair of the Greater Houston Partnership's Education Advisory Committee, I'm also the founding chair of Good Reason Houston. Now, this nonprofit is focused on improving education for all students across Harris County from cradle to career by eliminating achievement gaps. And they partner with school districts to drive innovation and support educators to maximize their impact. And they also work to engage parents and families in the community to ensure that every child has access to a quality school. Now, like good reason, the partnership is focused on improving student outcomes and supporting methods that really move the needle in classrooms. And while today's focus is gonna be on pre-K through 12, the partnership is also working on growing and strengthening higher education, uh, the higher education ecosystem also. Our Higher Education Committee is chaired by Thad Hill, and it's dedicated to bringing together leaders from our region's colleges and universities alongside business leaders to discuss potential solutions for growing and strengthening these institutions in our regions. We know that improving higher education outcomes in our region is really critical, and I anticipate that in future State of Educations, we'll touch on that subject also. Now, before we get started today, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who helped make today's event possible. Our gold sponsors for today are the Boston Consulting Group and SCF Partners. Our bronze sponsors are the College of Education and Human Development at Texas A&M University, Hush Blackwell, there we go, I always get a whoop for that, uh, Hush Blackwell LLP, Schlumberger, the University of Houston College of Education, Vanner Construction Management, Inc. Our networking cafe underwriter is HCA Houston Healthcare. And thank you to our photography underwriter, which is Children's Learning Institute at UT Health. So thanks to all of these folks for their support. I'd also like to, yeah, let's give them a hand. And I'd also like to acknowledge a number of public, uh, publicly elected officials that have joined us today. So if you could hold off your applause to the end. From Houston Community College, we have Adriana Thomas, uh, Aldean ISD trustee Rose Avalos, Aldean ISD trustee Viola Garcia, Aldean ISD trustee Steve Mead, they're out in, uh, in force, Spring ISD trustee Chris Vieira, Aldean ISD trustee Connie Esparza, and Aldean ISD trustee Paul Shanklin. So thank you guys for showing up. We appreciate it that you guys are with us today. Do we have anybody from the Consular Corps with us? If so, stand up, be recognized. No, okay, well, wish you were here. Um, so this morning's panel will shine light on the challenging but rewarding task of what it takes to move the needle in our classrooms, especially when educating large, diverse student populations. And our panelists are experts and practitioners who fiercely are dedicated to improving the lives of children through quality education. Now, the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. LaTanya Goffney, superintendent of Aldine ISD. She's also a member of the Upskill Houston Executive Committee at the GHP. So, LaTanya, come on up. I'll talk about you a little bit as you make your way up. Since taking over the helm of 
Aldine ISD in July of 2018. She came from Lufkin ISD. Dr. Goffney has de dedicated herself to the nearly 67,000 students and 9,000 employees of this district. And we talk a lot about HISD as being a big district. It's not like Aldine is small, it's a big district. And under her leadership, Aldine ISD has developed new initiatives uh, to offer parents and students more options, including a two-way dual language immersion program for the district. It's offering at five campuses starting this year. In fact, the most recent state accountability results show that among the state's large school districts, like Aldine ISD, the district gained the most in student achievement, second most in student progress, and second most overall. So let's hear it for Aldine ISD. Our next panelist is Mr. Pedro Martinez, came all the way over from San Antonio where he is the superintendent of San Antonio ISD. Pedro joined the district as superintendent in June of 2015, bringing to the district a laser-like focus on improving academic achievement. Under his leadership, SAISD has seen improved graduation and college matriculation rates, Innovative schools have been developed and launched, providing new models of education and strong academic programs and existing schools have been expanded to provide high quality choices for families. So thanks for coming over, good to see you. And our third panelist is Chris Barbick, is partner of the City Fund and the founder of Yes, Press Public, yes Prep Public Schools. Chris began his career as a teacher in Houston and founded Yes Prep with the goal of delivering the same access and opportunity to low-income communities that wealthy students received in private schools. Most recently, Chris founded the City Fund, a nonprofit organization that includes expert practitioners from the state, district, charter, and nonprofit sectors, and aims to provide additional support to local education leaders across the country. They work to ensure students are more prepared to further their education, get good jobs, and lead, the, lead, lead lives filled with opportunities. And our final, uh, and finally, our panel moderator is Andy Waite, who is the chair of the Greater Houston Partnerships Public Education Advisory Committee, and he's co-president of SCF Partners, one of our sponsors of today's event. As chair of the committee, Andy led the partnership's efforts in championing school finance reform in Austin this last legislative session. And in addition to serving on the board of directors at the partnership, he also serves as a director and is past co-chair of the board of Making It Better, a nonprofit providing literacy intervention services to at-risk children in low-income neighborhoods. So Andy's done a great job of leading the Public Education Advisory Committee, and I'm grateful to him for his leadership with the partnership. So welcome our panelists, and Andy, take it away. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm honored to be here, and I'm really interested in hearing from three extraordinary, extraordinary educators that we have here on the panel. So the way this is going to work is we're going to have about 40 minutes of moderated discussion, and we're going to focus on innovation in education, how to achieve success for economically disadvantaged students, and then accountability and outcomes. So we'll do that for about 40 minutes and that will leave us 10 minutes at the end for some audience questions. So uh, may I just mention that there are cards uh, on your tables. If you would like a question, uh, please go ahead and fill those cards out and those will be collected uh, towards the end of the moderated session. So um, maybe let me start with um, innovation in education. And we were really excited to have the three of you here on the panel because you've each been examples of leaders who've achieved uh, a measures that really make a difference, doing things in a different way, and really focus on increasing the quality of education for all students. So I'd really maybe like to start by asking each of you, and I'm gonna start with Chris, what innovative things are you working on now, you're championing, that you're really most excited about? Sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, well, the, uh, the work that we're really championing at the City Fund right now is helping districts rethink the, their role in delivering public education. And what I mean by that is, is that you know, most districts do a lot of things. They're responsible for the 
academic operations and finances of schools. They do everything from you know, curriculum to bus routes, and they do everything from teacher training to delivering meals every day. And, and that's, that's a lot for a district to take on, and it's really hard for them to be great at all those different things that they're expected to do. And so what some districts are, are tackling and, and is, is trying to, to really go down a different path where they are decoupling, and the best way to describe it is the, the day-to-day operations of school from what school oversight looks like. And what that means is, is that a lot of the schools that are, that, uh, that are taking on the day-to-day of educating kids are, are being run by different nonprofit organizations. And the, the job of the district is to manage a performance contract that that nonprofit has back with the district to make sure that those organizations are delivering on the results that they said they would in the contract. And, and these nonprofits can take lots of different forms. It could be a teacher that's got this great idea for a new innovative model and wants to launch the school of their dreams. It can be an existing nonprofit in, in this community that's already delivering services to families. Um, you know, neighborhood centers is a great example that for many years was doing all sorts of great work in the community, working with kids and families and decided to get into the, the school operating business and now runs different pre-K centers and elementary schools around the city. Um, or it can look like a partnership that Yes Prep has with Aldine and with Spring Branch around existing operators coming together and, and working with districts. And so what we're championing is probably the best way to describe it is what I would call a third way approach that gets away from let's not get hung up on the conversation of what kind of school it is. Let's get more focused on is this a great school or not? And if it's a great school, we need more of those. If it's not a great school, we need fewer of those because the last thing I'll say is when you talk to parents, that's what they really care about. They, don't, they could care less who's running the school. What they want to know is, is there a great school that, that's, that's in my neighborhood that's easy for me to get to? And so we're really trying to champion this, what I call a parent-friendly third-way approach. Thank you. Pedro, how about you? What do you champion? Sure, sure. And just to give a little context of San Antonio. So San Antonio, um, we have about 49,000 students. We have the third largest poverty, poverty rate and density across the entire state of Texas. The only, we have the highest of all urban districts. The only districts that are poorer than us are, in terms of our children, are uh, in a couple of border districts. Uh, Brownsville, for example, is one out in the border towns. And so four years ago, we had TA go back and look at, redo our accountability metrics to just say, where were we at four years ago? I'm starting my fifth year. And what we learned was we were an F district with 70% of our children in F seats. If you think about that, um, we have cut that down by 80%. We still got 20% is still way too many for me, but we cut that down by 80% and we're now a B district. And uh, it's interesting because you have the two districts in the, in the state that had the highest gains in the entire state of Texas. So uh, Aldi had the highest of, of districts 50,000 and up. We had the highest of 25,000 and up. Um, and so it's just interesting being, on, being here on the stage with Latanya. But for us, what we've done is, is really we're, we're redesigning, we're trying to redesign really the whole system. And what I mean by that, so in preschool, for example, we really are ch- challenging the notion of you know children you know really being in classrooms that are quiet, that are silent because it's interesting if you if you have a, a middle class or upper class family and you, and you see children of those families in preschool, I mean it's it looks really different than a high poverty school, and so we're challenging that and we're seeing amazing results early on. We're also working with uh, districts across the entire country, looking at how to better provide preschool kindergarten and first grade education because we see a lot of gaps in literacy with, with children of poverty. So we're doing that. On the other end, with, 12th gr- uh, with high schools, we created uh, some of the most interesting career tech academies uh, in the state of Texas. It was in partnership with HEB. They're called uh, CAS School. So we have one in technology. My children, that school has been open three years. If you go visit that school, it looks like a Google office space. It doesn't look like a high school. The children get access to four computer languages in their freshman year of high school. Think about that for a second. Um, they're now juniors. We just opened up a CAS medical school where our, our children as freshmen in their anatomy class will have equipment that medical schools have. So they actually will be able to, and I'm not a medicine person, I'm a math person, but I'm not a medicine person, but they will actually be able to dissect the human body vir- virtually um, through this equipment that right now mostly medical schools use. So we are redefining career tech completely based on what what is aligned to San Antonio. And then, uh, one other example, we have the, lo- the fastest growing dual language program in the 
entire state of Texas, we went from two schools having programs to now 49 out of 93 campuses. Why? Because San Antonio, uh, in San Antonio, the majority of our children are Latino, they have a Mexican American heritage, and it's the best fit. And we're seeing parents just, I mean, they, they love it, and, and so it's, it's one of the fastest growing uh, programs we have, but we're also seeing the results with it. And so those are just three examples. Uh, we also have several partnerships because one of the, I'll just end with this, the one thing about us in San Antonio, poverty is such a challenge that one of the things that I love about our, about our community is that we're not alone. I mean, we partner with everybody. We have partnerships with every single university, community college, with the business chambers. I mean, they are there with us. Um, and the only thing I ever ask our partners is, look, I'm not looking for transactional relationships. I need people that are, that are gonna be in it, that are gonna be in it with us, that are willing to put their, their reputation at risk. So for example, we've uh, opened up new school models specifically with our higher ed partners and their name is on it with us. So Trinity University opened up a school with us and so that school's flourishing, but their name is on there. Their professors are literally, were there on the first day of school welcoming families when we opened up that school. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Latanya, I know you have some exciting things going on. Would you care to share a few examples with us? Absolutely. Um, as many of you know, I transitioned to Superintendent of Aldine the last year. And so I've spent the last year looking, listening, and learning. And I remember when I interviewed, I told the board and I've told the community that it was important that our students graduate with more than a high school diploma, but with choices and opportunities. But when I was meeting with parents during my parent time, uh, yes, we want choices and opportunities in the future, but we also want choices and opportunities today, like right now. Uh, and so we're working to bring some of that choice. Unlike you, as I was looking at, listening to parents, uh, one of the things, and you heard about that, is they wanted to know about more dual language options. Mm -hmm. We had non-native speakers who wanted to learn Spanish, and they wanted their students to learn Spanish. And so we were able to uh, start five new dual language immersion programs across our district. So it's not only in one vertical, but in all five different verticals. In addition, we're opening up uh, Rose Avalos Pitek, uh, board member who the school's named after, she's here. And it, what's exciting about that is our students will not only get an associate's degree, but get a workforce licensure. So not only uh, will we focus on uh, cybersecurity, uh, non-destructive testing, uh, teacher prep, because we're growing our own teachers, as well as um, um, another skill that's gonna benefit them when they go to college. And last but not least, we decided that it was important that we take bold action for some of our schools that were uh, chronically underperforming. And so our, my colleagues in the North, Texas and Dallas, have done great work with ACE. It's called Accelerating Campus Excellence. And so uh, through the partnership with Good Reason Houston, and um, we were able to bring that program or that method to uh, two of our chronically underperforming schools. And I tell you, it's been amazing. When I tell you the community has uh, been excited about uh, what's gonna happen and how that's gonna help dramatically improve student achievement, it's just been powerful. So those are just a few things that are happening in all yeah. of the United States. Perfect, thank you. I may circle back to Chris. You, Chris, you have the sort of vantage point of seeing what's occurring in districts across the country through your work at City Fund. I mean, are there some common factors that lead to innovative thinking mm -hmm. in education? Are there things that you're seeing happening in other parts of the country that you, you think are good lessons that we can bring to Texas? Sure, well, I mean, there's great lessons right here, but um, we're, I think the the biggest trend that we're seeing when we look at districts that are really kind of pursuing the, the types of uh, work that um, Pedro and, and Dr. Goffin are doing is, is this difference between, I, I call it program change versus structural change. And what we've done for you know, decades in education is we love program change. <laughs> the, the problem is, is that we're not very good at implementing programs. And part of the, the reason we're not very good at implementing programs is because the leadership changes every three to five years. And when new leaders come in, they come with a mandate for change and they feel the need to come in and do the next set of new programs before the last programs, we even had a chance to see if they work or not. And so, you know, what happens is, you know, it doesn't get implemented well. And even if it does, it gets undone by the next, the next administration. And so what happens over decades is you have lots of programs layered on tops of lots of programs, layered on tops of lo lots of programs. And when you step back, there's really not a coherent approach to what the district's trying to do. And I think in the districts that we're seeing really making the, the most progress is they're not, they're not doing program change, they're doing structural change. And structural change looks like, you know, the, the sorts of things that, that, uh, that we just talked about. It's, it looks like a, um, for example, uh, Dr. Goffney mentioned ACE, which is an incredible program, 
in Fort Worth, they, um, they started ACE about three or four years ago, and they used private philanthropy to fund the $10,000 um, a year teacher stipends and the $15,000 a year leader stipends, which is awesome. I mean, they, they attracted their highest performing teachers to go to their, you know, traditionally underserved schools, and those schools went from an F to a B. The challenge is, is that what happens when that philanthropy runs out? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the example in Memphis, when the incentives went out, or when the, the incentives went away, the teachers went away. And when the teachers went away, the results went away. And so it's hard to sustain that effort. So what Fort Worth did is they said, well, there's this law called 1882. It provides financial incentives to the school, about $1,000 per kid, which is about a million bucks a year for your average elementary school. And they said, why don't we partner with Texas Westland and flip these schools into a partnership where now you know, these schools will operate as nonprofits inside Fort Worth. We won't change the staff. We won't change the program. This is working, but now we can replace private philanthropy with recurring public revenue to fund you know, the incentives that were, that were keeping the best people in the school. So I think that's, that's one example. Um, you know, what we're seeing in places like Denver, and I think you guys even did this in San Antonio, is you get a great high-performing principal. And what do we do with a great high-performing principal? Most times we promote them to the central office, which means now they're one layer further away from the kids and families. And, but that's, in our world of education, that's seen as a promotion. Well, why couldn't a promotion be, hey, you're kicking butt at this one school, let's give you a second school. Now you can do this over two schools and three schools, and now you've got a principal over a network. And so their, their impact's being spread laterally, not being promoted vertically, where they're further away from kids. So I think when we talk about structural change, I think we're talking about you know, those sorts of things that are really getting into what are the school actions that we're taking that can last over a sustainable period of time that are gonna have real impact for kids and families. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, let's pivot now to talk about how to achieve success for economically disadvantaged students. And maybe I'll start with you, Latanya. I know in your district, I think 87% are considered economically disadvantaged. How do you ensure that those children have access to what they need through, through your schools? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that 87% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch, and of those 87%, 82% qualify for free lunch. And so it just kind of, to put it it's an interesting perspective. Um, I'm very blessed, I'm fortunate, because it starts at the board level. You have to have a good board, and you heard Aldean ISD is in the house. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> our board members were very uh, serious about improving student outcomes. And so um, as we looked at that, though, where are we? Where are we in comparison to um, the, the state? Where are we in comparison to the rest of Harris County? And so we took a very honest look at where we are. And then we had to decide, where do we want to be? And so having those courageous conversations with our entire uh, leadership team and looking and saying, OK, what are we going to do? Because I know, and I know the commissioner is going to say it, but I've been saying it before it even became popular because I'm a testament of it. I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for the power of education. And I truly believe that um, um, zip code or uh, a student's current circumstances shouldn't dictate their futures. And so we have to work harder. We have to work smarter. And so we have to have people in place in order to do that courageous work. Because we can either make excuses or we can make progress, but we can't do both. Mm -hmm. And as uh, we've been on this journey for the last year, uh, we've been intentional about the goal of demonstrating what's possible. What's possible when you have your best leaders, what's possible when you have your best teachers, what's possible when you're doing good work for kids. And so um, we've been, no stone has been left unturned. We've been looking at every single thing that we're doing in all the ISD, and we've been intentional, relentless in our efforts to make sure that our, our teachers have the curriculum that they need to, in order to improve student outcomes and that our leaders understand where we are and where we want to be. So I think uh, first you have to remove the excuse that poor African American, uh, Latino, or any of our students cannot learn. They can learn. We just have to teach them differently. And so I started with leadership and then we're building on that. So in our district, um, so 90% poverty, and one of the things, and I, I've always worked in districts with high poverty rates mm -hmm. from Chicago to uh, Clark County in, in, Las, in uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. And, but when I came to San Antonio, it just looked really different. And, and, I, you know, and, and I'm, a ch I'm somebody who grew up in poverty, so I thought, okay, I think I understand it, um, but it was really different. And so to give you an example, I would walk through different neighborhoods, 
and I would see some neighborhoods, not as single family homes, they were small, but you know, they were single family homes. I go to other neighborhoods and it was homes that were falling apart, no sidewalks, uh, no internet infrastructure in the ground, uh, no AC, and you know, like Houston, I mean, San Antonio, we, we're hitting 105 degree weather, folks, for several weeks now. And I thought, God, this is really different. Um, and you know, no access to, I would look for you know, hospitals and medical facilities. I, look, I love HEB, HEB of course is headquartered in San Antonio. I look for HEBs. Um, <laughs> but again, I mean, you know, it was just, it, it looked, <laughs> but it looked different, it looked different. And so in San Antonio, what we did is we decided to go deeper and really dissect our poverty. And so what we did is we looked at median income of the families, we looked using census blocks, because we think that matters. And so what I discovered was the median income in San Antonio ISD is $32,000. For the state, it's, uh, it's about 65,000. That's also what it is for the nation. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, I said, well, I wonder if it matters if you have a two-parent household or a single-parent household. Because I saw a lot of, grand you know, when I would do parent meetings, I see a lot of grandparents and a lot of single parents. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, let's see what that looks like. We discovered that 52% of our families uh, were single-parent households. By the way, 8% are single dads, a lot of, grand, a lot of grandparents also raising, raising the children. I thought, okay, that's interesting, I think that matters. And then we said, okay, well, you know, I saw a lot of mobility. We actually created a teacher dashboard where it, it real time updates on a regular basis when children are moving from one school to another, because I've never seen that transiency that the way we have it in San Antonio. So we created that, so I said, well, maybe owning their own home matters. And so we put that as one of the factors, do they own their own home? And then the last one we said, does it matter if the adults in the, in the family, um, what their educational level is? Because we, we started creating new school models and we designed them to be integrated. So I literally have children of college professors and I also have children that are homeless in the same exact rooms. Mm -hmm. They wear uniforms, you can tell who's with, mm -hmm. who's which, but I mean, they're in the same classrooms and we did that by design. So I said, does the educational level of the parents matter? I have parents, folks who have never graduated from high school that are illiterate. And again, I also have parents that are college professors. So we put all that in, and using that, we use that to align our resources. I also use that to create what we call a master teacher initiative, which is, these are our expert teachers. We pay them $15,000 extra. They do work extra time though, um, but they work in our toughest, highest, you know, highest poverty density schools. By the way, in HB3, that system has been adopted by the state now, statewide. So you will be able to see that for the entire state of Texas, uh, what that density poverty looks like in Houston and Alden and everywhere else. Um, and so what we've learned doing that is first of all, now, four, you know, this is my fifth year, five years into it, it's really been fascinating. We're now seeing a disconnect between the poverty level and the performance of the school. So in other words, when I first started, you saw where I had the most density poverty, you'd see very low performance. I'm starting to see now, you know, that's becoming less of a factor, even though it's still there, by the way, and I always, I always tell, remind the community, trust me, we have, you know, communities and schools in our district, we have, I, I put, you know, we have food pantries in every single school, we have closets of uniform, I mean, you name it, we, mm -hmm. we have all that in our schools, so I'm not saying it's not a factor, but on academic performance, I'm, now see, I'm not seeing that correlation anymore. And now the correlation I'm seeing is that because I was, you know, we were incentivizing so many of our strong teachers or more stronger teachers to come into these schools, I'm starting to see now more, more of a correlation with teacher performance than I am with poverty, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that's, that's what we're really, really trying to learn from, but I'll, t I'll just end with this. Poverty is always gonna be a challenge, um, but I'll tell you, when you couple poverty, any of you have inexperience or teachers that are not performing well, folks, that is the death for our children. I mean, they cannot overcome that. And so for us, that's the biggest challenge. So I applaud what Latanya is doing because that really is the best, best tool you have to try to deal with that issue of poverty. Could I ask you, you, you touched very briefly on HB, House Bill 3. What has been the sort of biggest benefit to your districts of the passage of House Bill 3? So for us, again, um, they adopted our census block system mm -hmm. and they also increased the weights for the, for the density and poverty. Not a lot, by the way, because my suburban colleagues would have, would have had a conniption, <laughs> right? But, but, but <laughs> enough that for us, it's a great building base. And for me, you know, what I love is that just acknowledging it, that having a median income with a single parent household of $20,000 is different than one has two parents of 40,000, which is like you reduce, exactly. right? The free versus reduce, but now you can get even more granular. 
And then what I also love, which we're gonna be taking advantage of is, now I have a pathway to sustain my teacher initiative because the new system that the state is adopting, teachers will be recognized as either masters, no coincidence that we use that name, but you know, uh, master teacher level, uh, exemplary and recognized, these teachers will be able to get up to $30,000 of additional income if they work in the highest poverty schools using the census block system. So for me, uh, these are brand new. By the way, nobody in the country has, adopt, has done this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's something to watch in our state. What I'm gonna be fascinated to see is how this evolves across the different districts. Mm -hmm. that that. Right, in, addi in addition to being able to attract and retain the best teachers mm -hmm. and train, uh, we're gonna have an opportunity for the early educator, uh, I'm sorry, the early education allotment, which everyone's heard about the fact that we're expanding pre-K and the funding that's attached to that goes for K through three. And so with those additional funds, um, pre-K has always been um, a priority for all these, and we're very blessed in that regard. But we're able to repurpose those funds and actually get our <coughs> early uh, teachers, our primary teachers trained so that we can, again, attract uh, and make sure that our students' needs are being met. Because we recognize that literacy is a huge issue in schools of poverty, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, kindergarten readiness. And so uh, we're partnering with uh, uh, ch the Children's Literacy in, uh, Initiative to make sure that our teachers are trained. I, I don't know, I'm getting paranoid by the time, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Don't worry>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we have an early educator allotment. In addition, uh, just excited about the fact that um, poverty is being seen and, and, and schools are getting additional funding so that we can uh, overcome some of those additional challenges. Yeah. Chris, I may, may pivot to you and just sort of say, what other circumstances beyond economic ones uh, in a student's background do you feel have been factors that have had the most significant impact on educational achievement? Well, I think both these guys touched on it. I mean, you, you can't have the conversation without talking about teacher effectiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's just study after study after study after study that just shows the power of a great teacher. And it's not just the power that that teacher has for the nine or 10 months that the you know, child's in their classroom, but it, you know, they've, researchers have measured the impact that it has one, two, three years after a child leaves that that teacher's classroom. And unfortunately, the reverse is also true. I mean, the, the impact that an ineffective teacher can have on a child is, is as devastating as, as you know, hopeful that a great teacher can have. So I think that's, you know, that's probably the biggest one. And it's also one that schools have 100% control over. I mean, a lot of the issues that these guys are, are addressing are things that are coming into the school from you know, just circumstances that kids and families are uh, facing you know, in the community. But you know, schools have 100% control over the teachers they put in front of kids every day. Um, I think the last thing I'd say in this is just how we talk about effective matters. What is effective? And even though we tend to pay teachers based on experience and degrees, again, study after study after study after study shows that's not what makes a teacher effective. Um, and you really have to look at the child's performance in the classroom to know what effective is. And I think you know, the work that these guys are doing to really incentivize you know, the best teachers, the most effective teachers to go to the traditionally under-resourced schools. I mean, we're seeing examples all over the state now that, that that work matters. And I think the question now is just how do you sustain those level of incentives so that you can keep the best teachers where they're needed the most. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'm gonna switch gears now to <laughs> accountability and outcomes. And Latani, I'll start with you. Um, we've heard the two sides of the coin on the accountability rating system. On the one hand, it provides transparency and a metric that parents and others can use to um, assess you know, the, ch the schools that they are choosing. But also, we've heard the other side that does it encourage sort of teaching to for the test as opposed to teaching to educate. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? So those two <laughs> differing perspectives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting enough, we've been having a lot of conversations in our district about STAR in general and recognizing that uh, we give it too much credence. Uh, the STAR test should be the floor and not the ceiling. It shouldn't be what we aspire to achieve. It should just be what we were able to overcome and, and move forward. As it relates to A through F, I've been a superintendent for 12 years and prior to that I was a campus leader. And I can tell you we've always had accountability. And um, while the, per the system is not perfect, I can tell you it's been the only one that has even <coughs> tried to include or be rooted in any type of equity or anything focused on equality. And the fact that it's not, um, again, not perfect, 
but the fact that you can look at and be able to, to understand it. Um, I remember a few months ago when the commissioner called and he said he wanted to come and host our town hall meeting at um, our ATF town hall at um, Stevens Elementary. Stevens Elementary is 90% um, low SES, 90% uh, uh, Hispanic, and I tell you what though, we have a phenomenal leader, we have good teachers and good kids, and they've done great work. And it was evident in the fact that they'd gone from a D to an A. Um, and so when he looked at that, and I just happened to think about it, I was talking to the principal and I said, you know, uh, in the past you'd have just gone from IR to met standard. And no one really would have understood the work that went into moving up to, uh, to, to letter grade. And so I understand the premise behind it. I'm excited about the fact that it's the best that we've ever had or that I've had in my, my uh, time as a leader. And I'm excited for what it means and the fact that um, if we didn't have accountability, we would mask a lot of issues as it relates to black, brown, and students of poverty because you, you wouldn't be able to see it or we'd be compared to those who have uh, challenges that are not as, as significant. So um, I remain encouraged and um, looking forward to improving it because again, I had, was on the phone with the commissioner's office uh, this week because there's some couple of issues and some things that we want to see different. And so looking forward to working with my colleagues across the state to make sure that it continues to improve. Okay. Uh, I just make a reminder if people have uh, questions to fill out the cards and they'll be collected um, and they'll hopefully make their way to the stage soon. Um, but uh, Pedro, maybe I can pose the question to you and again, probably from somebody who isn't in the education world, you know, 24 seven, when you look at the statistics that I think um, by some measures we graduate children from high school and only 16% based on SAT or ACT are college ready. I think 28% of kids six years after graduation, um, you know, have a post-secondary uh, qualification. So that's the stats on one side. And then you look at the rating systems where literally every major city, the public school system gets a B grade. How do you, how mm -hmm. do you reconcile those two data sets? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and I think, um, so, so just a couple extra data points just from what, what you added. If you're in the state of Texas, if you are a fee and reduced lunch child, which again, we feel is outdated, because again, that's why we developed the census system, but using that measure, only 9% of our children today are getting at least a certificate, which is not even an associate's degree. Um, it's usually about you know a semester to two semesters in community college. Uh, much less, of course, a bachelor's degree. Uh, if you're not an FRL, the numbers are still significantly below the nation's uh, statistics. Um, why? Well, you, know, you can have a whole bunch of theories, the way the economy of Texas has grown, and, it, and in the old days, maybe you didn't need as much post-secondary uh, experience. That has completely changed. And what I would argue that we have two different states right now. We have one where if you're educated, it's an amazing economy, it's an amazing state. You have opportunities that are unbelievable. If you are somebody who comes from poverty and for whatever reason don't, doesn't have access to good education, you see, the, you see the stats that I see, which you basically have no opportunities. Um, and so the, the good thing I'll tell you is our commissioner is the first commissioner. I've only been here, this is my fifth year, so I'm not the expert in Texas, but I've done my research. I'm a, uh, I love to do research. This is the first commissioner that I've seen that has ever put those stats out. That's the reason why you know those. That's the reason why I know those stats. I'm not from Texas. And so first of all, it starts first with the, the conversation. I also think the commission understands that we have been so obsessed with high school graduation for so long that that was the end all be all, similar to the star, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think what he's done with the current system is at least said, look, let's make sure that you're on the path because you're gonna see, and you've seen some adjustments that are happening in the next two years, um, because he knew he couldn't change everything. So you're gonna see a bigger emphasis on uh, career tech certificates that really matter for actually living wage jobs. You're gonna see more emphasis on college readiness. Uh, we have doubled our SAT scores in our district. We, have, we are now exceeding the state in ch uh, children not needing remediation through the TSI exam in the state. Um, but why? Because we, we saw that's where the system is going. And by the way, it's the right thing to do. 
And so there is, a, there is right now uh, a challenge in the state, but I feel that's gonna, you're gonna see that correlation going a lot stronger. But by the way, what, what also is needed, and I will say this to the business community, the other thing that our children need access to besides good education is they need access to job shadowing and internships. And I'll just say this, if you come from wealth, even if your child's a C student, and if your child wants to be a doctor, you better believe you're gonna call your doctor friends and get that child some kind of job shadowing or internship experience. Or same thing with law, same thing with engineering. Our children of poverty never had that access, and by the way, most of my kids, they're gonna work their butts off and they're gonna be A and D students and still never have that access. And so we have to close those gaps, and so that opportunity gap exists, but you're right. But this commissioner is pushing hard on college readiness in a state, by the way, that has never wanted to look at that. And I add, yeah, sure. um, just to, so we're clear, uh, part of the issue is, as you stated, um, there's no safety net. Um, even before getting to, as a first generation college student, um, it was the fall of 1994, I was enrolled to go to the Navy. I was number eight in my class. But because I didn't have an exemplar or a model or anyone to tell me about how to even go through the college uh, enrollment process at home, I didn't think it was an option, but I had a great counselor and my calculus teacher, they provided an intervention and I was able to, uh, to uh, I still had time to apply for Sam Houston. Uh, and then after applying, I had a counselor who sat with, down with me to complete the FAFSA because I didn't have a, my mom was 15 when she had me and I never knew my father, grandmother had a fifth grade education, grandfather couldn't write. And so there was no one at home to go and complete a FAFSA and send it off. So our, our, some of our students come from similar backgrounds, they don't have those resources at home. And so we've gotta be intentional about that at school to get them to college. And so I'm excited about uh, some of our other experiences and our other partnerships, either uh, we're part of Harris County Promise and super excited to get that kicked off with Good Reason Houston. Uh, part of Emerge, we have students who have uh, potential to go and compete and attend highly selective colleges and then one goal. And so once we get them to, in order to get them through, it takes an, an additional layer of, of support. Because as he just alluded to, you if the FAFSA doesn't come in, if the student loans don't come in, some of our kids have to come home yeah. because they don't have another option. I saw that while I was in school. While I worked full time as a correctional officer, I had friends who were just as smart as I was, but they didn't have the resources. Mm -hmm. And we recognize when our kids go to college, if they have an off day and they fail and they're unable to qualify for FAFSA, we hope they don't fail, <laughs> then we're gonna write the check and we're gonna be able to move forward. So you, some of the success that you're not seeing maybe because I believe very strongly that our, our higher ed entities, I know Sam Houston's here, I know Preview's here, I think we need to take some bold action and um, once we get them through high school, how do we get them through college? Thanks. Chris, you, 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 you have a different perspective, you have a different vantage point. What are your thoughts on the, the, some of the topics we've just been talking about on accountability and outcome? Well, I mean, I think the, the test is a measure and how it impacts the culture of a school or system is up to the people there. I mean, leaders make a decision to focus on a test or not focus on a test or determine how much time teachers and principals are focusing on tests. That's not the test fault. That's a leadership issue. So I think we have to parse those two things apart. Um, and I think systems respond to carrots and sticks, unfortunately. And so, and I think you know, we just talked about both of them. There are a lot of incentives in the new house bill, a lot of dollars tied to outcomes. Um, that's a great carrot for, mm -hmm. for system leaders and for school leaders. And there's a, there, at the end of the day, there's a scorecard. And depending on how you do, you can view it as a stick or not. But I think if it's all incentives, we're never going to push the bottom up. And if it's all sticks, um, we're gonna turn people off. So it's gotta be the right balance. Have we struck the right balance in Texas? I think it's too early to see, but those two things are in place. And now I think as a community and as leaders in schools, we just have to provide feedback to make sure that those carrots and sticks are massaged the right way so that they're, they're pushing schools and systems to be as good as they can be. Okay, great. Well, maybe turning now to a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, one of the questions is that now that the legislature has approved greater funding for sport education for all of our children through House Bill 3, what can everybody in this room do to support educators and reinvigorate the culture that education matters and it's everyone's business? You know, I, I would say to start with, um, you know, 
and I'll say this, you know, because poverty, our state, you know, the, the more than half of our children qualify statewide for premium reduced lunch, and I'm seeing those numbers grow, and now with the census system, I think you're gonna continue to see the density of poverty grow, and I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the quickest way to, do, you know, we have, we, have to, we have to really take care of the educational issues. As, as, as Chris said, there is no substitute for leadership, there is no substitute for talent, period. Mm -hmm. And it is the one fighting chance we have to overcome some of the challenges of poverty, on the business side, I will tell you, you know, one of the ways to tackle poverty is frankly having better jobs and having pe better paying jobs for our families. And of course, that's all tied together, right, in terms of their skill sets, but partnerships, because the reality is that we're gonna always have this up, up, you know, uphill battle to, and I always tell my teachers, you know, they see everything, they really do. I mean, they see the good, the bad, and the other. they see everything. But at the end of the day, we don't make any excuses. Mm -hmm. um, their morale has never been higher because they're seeing the results that we're getting regardless of what's happening in that child's home. And we, like I said, we see everything. But I can't help but think about, you know, when I step back, you know, most likely these are the parents that are cleaning, you know, in my city, they're cleaning, they're, they're the ones cleaning the hotel rooms. Uh, they're the ones, you know, in fast food industries. They're the ones that are literally having to have two jobs to just to make ends meet. And that's why I always tell my staff, like, like you know, let's be sympathetic to our parents. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're partners with them in, in educating their children. But I think where the business community can come in is really ensuring that again, let's get that at its root cause, and that's jobs, that's that's opportunities economically, and then let's work together because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we all have to partner working with the children. But again, we have to look at the parents as well. Mm -hmm. And I echo what he's saying. And then in addition, just wanting for everyone's children what you want for your own personal children. Uh, and if it's not good enough for your own personal children, then it's not good enough for anyone's children. I think uh, I, I heard you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> because Andy, oh, oh, go no, no, go you, go, you got it. Yeah. I was just going to add one thing. Um, you know, I went back. I just want to go back to this idea of this. You know, this idea of program and structural change. And the reason most leaders don't go anywhere near structural change is because you're talking about shifting power and who makes decisions, and nobody wants to go near that, especially in the high pressure, high scrutiny jobs that these guys have. And so. I think one thing the community can do is when there's leaders that are willing to be bold and do that, the community's gotta have their back. They gotta stand up, they gotta be heard, they gotta show up at a board meeting, they gotta show up you know, in the media. And we, you know, we all kinda like to you know, sort of sit on the sidelines and hope that things are better. And leaders like this don't come along very often. And when they do, um, I think it's incumbent on everyone in this room to make sure that, that they got their back. Because a lot of times people step out there on the skinny branches all by themselves and they look around and there's nobody there, and that's why they leave in three years, and that's why you see the merry-go-round of like leader after leader after leader after leader. So when you got somebody good and they're willing to, to, to do that, you know, people in this room need to have their back. Well, and this is a, a great segue, because probably two or three of the questions here all focus around the topic of how do you recruit uh, the best and brightest into <coughs> the teaching profession, and with, you know, how do you maintain that passion for education um, when there's so many sort of competing alternatives for talent? So what, what more can we do to strengthen that recruitment pipeline and, and keep, pe keep the best people in the profession? You know, it's interesting. So we did a survey of our new teachers and our, and our uh, existing teachers. Um, and one of the things we've seen is we've seen our, our turnover rates reduce, we're, we're at an all time low in terms of teacher turnover. I'm keeping my top performing teachers over 90% more than ever. And, and we've made a lot of changes in our district and frankly we've, uh, the union has been after me since, you know, at least I mean, you can find a lot of stuff on the internet that I'm just glad my children don't have access <laughs> to it right now. Um, but what we've been able to do is first of all, what, what I'm very proud of is the number one reason our teachers wanna be in our district is because of the children we serve. They have bought into the mission of serving children of high poverty. And then what I owe them, and I feel we owe them, is they gotta make sure that they're compensated well, that we treat them as professionals, that we elevate the whole profession. So that's why you know, we created this initiative to elevate our, our teachers, and, and it, is, it is performance driven. I mean, they get $15,000, but it is our top performing teachers. Uh, they do work more for it, and by the way, that wasn't my choice. That was actually the union because, you know, that was a compromise with them. I said, you, so you're saying you want the teachers to work more days for this pay? You sure about that? Because, but I said, you know what? My children could use more time with these teachers. Okay, I'll buy into it. Um, and now we're going to sign on to the new state system. That you know, really, the vision is that our teachers should be able to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. So, 
a little quick secret, I don't know if you know this, average teacher salary for a 20 year veteran, whether they're in Houston, Dallas, Austin, or San Antonio, guess what that number is? $65,000 for a 20 year veteran, ladies and gentlemen. And I just feel, you know, I don't think that's right. I'm sorry, I just don't think that's right. And, and so I feel now, I think with, we have some tools now, time will tell, but I really am excited about what the state has done because, you know, and Aldine's already doing it, I've been doing it, but now we have a state partner with it, and I really want to elevate the profession. I think that's what it's going to take. Absolutely. Sure. Latanya, if you want to add, add to that. I echo his sentiment. Um, teachers are at the heart of the matter, and we, um, I, I tell my coaches, you know, because we want to prepare our kids to compete. And so our teachers have got to be prepared to prepare our students to compete. So in addition to paying them higher salaries, we've got to make sure that they have good curriculum in order yes. to teach our students. Because a lot of our, our teachers have the heart for dealing with students of poverty. They have the heart for dealing with black and brown and students who come from um, you know, some unfortunate uh, backgrounds. But heart sometimes can get in the way of having those high expectations for, um, for success. And so we want to make sure that they have the tools necessary for them to be able to meet the students' needs as opposed to just feeling sorry and having lower expectations. And so with the additional expectations, we certainly want to elevate and be able to pass that, uh, the funds on from House Bill 3 and so on and so forth. But I can't, um, I cannot um, emphasize enough the, the importance of our teachers being prepared to teach our children as well. Chris. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think we're, at, we're paying blue collar wages for white collar jobs. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and we've made the job a lot harder with higher standards and more rigorous assessments. And so I think we have, to, we have to start the conversation there. And right now, if you're 23 coming out of college, you can pull up any district website and go to their salary schedule and know what you're going to make in 25 years, whether you're awesome or not. That's right. And I can't think of anything more unmotivating to a high flying 23 year old coming out of college and knowing that's what I'm gonna make in 25 years. So when you couple that with the fact that people entering the workforce today are changing jobs six, seven, eight times, I think you know part of this, we have to be realistic about what a profession is. I mean, my mom taught for 35 years. I, that, I don't know that that's, that's the world that we live in today. Um, but whether it's five, 10 or 15 or two, um, we gotta address pay or we're gonna be having the same conversation mm -hmm. 10 years from now. Great. Well, um, we are at the end of our allotted time, so please join me in thanking three extraordinary panelists. So um, what we need to do now is uh, exit the room so that they can prepare it for the luncheon. There are some uh, exhibits outside our, uh, of a number of educational related <laughs> endeavors. Uh, you're invited to uh, browse them at your leisure and then we'll be back in the room uh, once they've reset it for lunch with uh, Commissioner Morath. Thank you everybody. <laughs>